Yeah, good morning. Happy Sunday to you. What do you think your life is going to look like in five years' time? Maybe, maybe you have some specific milestones in mind, things you would like to see accomplished. Perhaps in five years, you expect that you are going to be graduated and working your dream job, right? It might be that in five years, you expect that you'll be married, or you might be expecting to welcome your first grandchild. Go ahead and nudge them. Just nudge your kids and be like, in five years... I'm expecting. In the next five years, you, you might want to go on that dream vacation. You might want to reconcile a relationship with that friend that you've kind of been separated from. Many of us have specific goals that we would love to accomplish in the next few years. But for others of us, there may not be these specific kind of achievements or milestones that we're thinking about. Instead, if I ask you, what do you want to see your life look like in five years? You'd say, well, you know, I've learned that life comes at you pretty fast and nobody can predict the future. Future. So I don't know what my life is going to look like in the next five years, but I hope it's better than it is now. I, I hope that I am financially stronger in five years. I hope that I am in much better physical health five years from now, despite the fact that I'm five years older. I hope that I'll be five years closer to God. And hear me now, hope is a wonderful thing. I hope all of those things for you as well. But I came to church to tell somebody today that five years from now, your life will not be determined by your hopes, but your habits. Are you with me? Not by what you hope, not by what you wish, but by what you do. This will determine where your life goes in the years to come. It is not enough to want it. You got to work for it, and the work is always worth it. If you have ever set your mind to a goal and you have worked hard and accomplished it, you know how joyful that is. You know what a good place that is to be in, and that is exactly what I want for you, and I think it's exactly what God wants for you as well. Today is the final message in our Power to Change series, and before we get to our passage for the day, which is going to be Galatians chapter number six, let me remind you of what we've talked about over the past couple of weeks because I don't want you to miss anything if you weren't here or maybe just by way of refresher, you'll remember that in week number one, we talked about the fact that true change is not behavior modification, it's spiritual transformation. Remember, we said that if you change your behavior without changing your heart, the behavior will almost certainly come back. And that's because change doesn't start on the outside and work its way inside. It almost never happens that way. Instead, true and lasting change begins on the inside, and then it permeates outward into every other area of our life. Then in week two, last week, we talked about the fact that change is so much closer than we realize, that you are so much closer to freedom, you are so much closer to health and happiness than you might have ever realized. We talked about the fact that, tragically, we choose to suffer for years from problems we could fix in months. Oh, what a waste. It's so unnecessary to suffer for years from problems that could be addressed in mere weeks or months. And so uh, today what I want to do is I want to get intensely practical. I want to do everything I possibly can to give you some handles and some help. How do you go about actually changing and solving some of the problems that you might have in your life? Well, Whatever it is you're battling, the Apostle Paul has a great deal of help to offer us in Galatians chapter number six. In this passage, he introduces us to something that I'm going to call the laws of sowing and reaping, the laws of sowing and reaping. So let's read it together, and then you'll see what I mean. Galatians chapter number six, verses seven, eight, and nine, Paul says this, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Um, I just need to be sure that I clarify that although Paul says a man reaps what he sows, this applies to ladies also, okay? The laws of sowing and reaping are equal opportunity, and we know that because Paul goes on to say then, whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. So let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if... We do not give up. Let's pray. God, would you bless the reading of your word today? Would you illuminate your truth? And God, would you convict us of areas that need to change? More than any of that, God, would you convince us that you have good things in store for us if we will simply obey whatever it is you call us to do? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, do we have any farmers in the room this morning? 
Okay, like one person was like this. Um, okay, all right, I get you. For those of us who don't have manure on our boots today, let me help you to understand a little bit of, about what Paul is saying here, because this is an agrarian metaphor, living in a metropolis like Calgary. It might be a little bit lost on us. He uses a couple of words that I'm certain you can figure out by context, but I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page so we understand what he's saying. First of all, he begins by talking about sowing. And when Paul is talking about sowing here, he is literally talking about planting seeds into the ground. To sow means to put seeds into the ground, to water them, to tend them, and hopefully eventually to harvest them, to enjoy them. So when he says sowing, he is literally talking about seeds in the ground. Then he talks about reaping, and reaping means to harvest. It means to enjoy the fruit of your sowing. So if you planted seeds in the ground, and later on in the year you walk out and you pluck that juicy red apple off the tree, you are reaping what you have sown. Are you tracking with me? Reaping and sowing. These are the laws of reaping and sowing. And um, before I, I read them to you, I want to point out here, like, you might be reading this, and you, you read that first line or two there, and it seems like Paul is being kind of harsh, isn't it? Like, he's like, don't be deceived. Like, literally, the way this is written in the Greek is, stop being stupid, okay? God cannot be mocked. And then you're like, whoa, 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 I didn't know I was mocking God. Calm down, Paul, all right? He's going to talk through what this means and, and why it is that he uses such harsh language. We're actually going to save the God cannot be mocked part for the very end. I promise we're going to come back to it. But I want you to just focus for a moment on the, the starting phrase there. He says, do not be deceived. Why does he say that? Well, because there are a lot of people in our world who are deceived. That is, they do not understand the laws of sowing and reaping that he is about to outline. And because of that, because they have been deceived about the way the world works, they harvest untold frustration, hurt, pain, and sorrow in life. Paul is essentially saying from the very beginning, hey, you can ignore what I'm about to say but you do so at your own risk. If you choose to ignore the laws of sowing and reaping, it's probably not going to go very well for you. Okay, what are these three laws of sowing and reaping? I'm going to give them to you all right at the beginning, and we'll talk about each one as we go. The first one, you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. Duh, that's pretty obvious. I know, stick with me. Not only do you reap what you sow, but you reap more than you sow. You will reap more than what you sow. And third, you will reap only after you sow. The three laws of sowing and reaping from Galatians 6. You reap what you sow, you reap more than you sow, and you reap only after you sow. Again, if you understand these principles, if you cooperate with them, if you work in concert with them, if you, uh, we call these laws. And I want you to understand these laws are, uh, they're not laws in the sense of like, you must do this and you must not do that. It's not, it's not that kind of law. It's not a moral law. Instead, it's kind of like the law of gravity. It's like God has instituted a particular order or function in the universe, and if you ignore it, you do so at your own peril. Suppose this morning that I decided to go up to the top of the building here at Connect, and I jumped off, and I fell and broke my leg. Now, if I said like, God, that's not fair, all of you would say, uh, you get what you deserve, dum-dum. There's this thing called the law of gravity, and you know what? If you cooperate with the law of gravity, which says what goes up must come down, then things will go well for you, and if you ignore the law of gravity, then you do it at your own peril. This is the kind of law that Paul is talking about. If you ignore these three truths, then you will have a lot of pain and frustration, but if you choose to operate according to them, you will experience bigger better things than you could have ever imagined. So let's talk about each of these three one by one. We start with the first, you reap what you sow. I want you to imagine for a moment that you are a millennial who loves avocado toast. Uh, redundant sentence, I know. Uh, as, a, as a Gen Xer, I'm not supposed to pick on the millennials, but you guys make it so easy. All right, so let's say... Let's say that you, you really love avocados because you love guac or you want it on your toast or whatever the case may be. And uh, you, you, you get tired, though, of going to the grocery store all the time and trying to find the fresh ones. It's like, I want an avocado today, but there are no fresh ones at the grocery store. So you have to buy a big bag of them, and then you bring them home, and they sit on your counter. And like of the eight avocados in the bag, seven of them go bad before you ever eat them. I don't know. That's the way it is in the Swayze household. Anyway, so you get tired of this whole process, and you think to yourself, you know, it would be a a whole lot better if I just had an avocado tree in my backyard. Like once that thing grew and matured, then I could walk out there and I could grab an avocado absolutely every single day. That would save me a lot of heartache. The problem is you don't have any avocado seeds in your pantry, but you do have some almonds and they're seeds too, right? So like 
as long as you plant some seed and you hope that you get good harvest, you hope you get what you want from planting the seed, then it's probably all going to turn out, right? Imagine somebody doing that. We would say, that's foolish, that's stupid. Come on, nobody would ever do it. It's ridiculous. And you're right, it is ridiculous. And yet, you and I do this every single day in various areas of our life. We plant one kind of seed expecting to reap a different kind of harvest. Are you with me? Paul says the first rule of reaping and sowing is that you will reap what you sow. You cannot plant one kind of seed and expect a different kind of fruit. You cannot plant bad seed and expect a good fruit. That is not how things work. This is why so many people, they'll, they'll look at their lives and they're like, I don't understand how I got here. How did all this happen? Like, this is not what I expected. This is not what I wanted. This is not fair. Why is this happening to me, God? Are you punishing me? No, you are simply experiencing the laws of rowing, uh, of sowing and reaping, rather, okay? Um, so think, imagine a guy for a moment who sows seeds of lust. Like everywhere he goes, man, he is checking out the ladies at the office, at the gym, online. Everywhere he goes, he is fantasizing about the women around him. And he's also married, and he hopes, expects, believes that he is going to have a healthy marriage with lots of intimacy and trust, and he doesn't experience it. Why? Is God punishing you? Did you marry the wrong person? No! You are experiencing what you planted. You are reaping what you have sown. If you constantly sow in your mind that every woman is available to you and one woman is never going to be enough, guess what? You will eventually reap that harvest. You reap what you sow. Imagine a woman who uh, sows seeds of negativity and gossip. And she wants to have great friendships, but she doesn't because nobody can trust her. And so she thinks to herself, I must have just made friends with the wrong people. I, I chose some bad ones, you guys. No, you are experiencing the fruit of what you planted. If you sow negativity and gossip and division, guess what? You're going to harvest negativity and division and gossip. That is simply how it works. Imagine uh, somebody, an employee who gives half effort at their job, and they show up late, and they miss deadlines, but they still expect that they're going to get a promotion. You can't plant bad seed and expect good fruit. You will reap what you sow. And so if you reap poor seed, you're going to end, if you sow poor seed, rather, you are going to end up reaping poor seed. Imagine a dude, and, and he drinks a sixer every Friday, because come on, it's the weekend finally, all right? And then he does the same thing on Saturday, because like it's still the weekend, and then he does the same thing on Sunday because it's like, oh, the weekend's over. I got to go back to work tomorrow. And he looks around and he's like, why am I 35 pounds overweight and I have liver damage? It's because you are reaping what you sowed. If you plant one kind of seed, you can guarantee yourself that same kind of harvest. That is how God has designed the world to work. Very often when people's marriages and friendships and careers or physical well-being, they go off the rail. They want to blame other people. They very often want to blame God. But my brothers in Christ, my sisters in Christ, God did not do this to you. You did this to you. That, that the choices we make do have consequences for good and for bad. And very often, things that feel like punishments are not punishments. They are merely the harvest of what we have spent weeks, months, and years planting in our lives. If you plant bad seed, you cannot expect to experience good fruit. You reap what you sow. Now, that sounds like a downer kind of message, right? But it's not. There is good news. Here's the good news. If you don't like what you're reaping change what you're sowing. If you don't like what you're reaping, you can change what you're sowing. This is one of the reasons I love God so much. God doesn't say like, you're stuck. You made your bed, you'll lie in it, and this is what you will deal with forever. No, he tells us the truth. You reap what you sow. So if you're reaping things that you do not like, change what you sow, and you will experience a different harvest. If life is not going well, you can change the inputs and receive a different output. It might require you to switch up some things. You might have to change when you go to bed or how you spend your money or your social media habits or your communication strategy or whatever. But if you change the seeds in your life, 
then you will experience a different kind of harvest. Change the seeds, change the harvest, because you reap what you sow. Now, I know there's some of you in the room, and you're like, but Dan, come on, come on, come on, come on, okay? Like, the stuff that happened to me is not my fault. And in fact, bro, you said last week that sometimes I'm going to have to solve problems that I didn't cause, so there you go. It's not my fault. And you're right. I understand that. There are people in the room, and there have been very, very difficult things that uh, you've walked through, you are walking through, and they are not the result of seeds that you have sown. That absolutely does happen, and so I'm not speaking to those circumstances, but I am still speaking to you folks and to everybody else in the room. And the reason why is because although uh, there are things that we, there are harvests that we will reap that we didn't sow the seeds of, those are usually the exception and not the rule. And, And as we often say, it's the exceptions that prove the rule, okay? Yes, there are things that can happen to you that you had no control of, circumstances far out of your control, I agree. But most of the things that go wrong in our lives are the results of the choices that we have made in the days, weeks, and months leading up to that particular uh, experience. Most of the things that are wrong in our lives are under our authority and ability to change. Most of the things that we deal with, we could fix. We could bring a resolution to if we would start to sow different kinds of seeds. But too many of us are deceived. We live thinking, I can sow this kind of seed and reap that kind of harvest, and that is simply not how things work. You reap what you sow each and every time. But it goes further than that because the second law of reaping and sowing is that you reap more than you sow. You reap more than you sow. Um, When when a farmer, I had to do a lot of research, okay? This might surprise you to know, but like I don't know a lot about farming, okay? And so I had to do a lot of reading, but here's one interesting thing that I learned. Like uh, think about a kernel of wheat, a seed of wheat, okay? If a farmer here in Alberta or wherever it is they plant wheat, if they take one of those kernels and they put a single kernel into the ground, eventually with enough time and a little bit of care, that single seed will become a stalk with three heads of wheat on it, right? You've probably seen that before. Each one of those heads of wheat will have approximately uh, 33 different kernels inside of it. So catch this now. Uh, The one seed gets planted in the ground And after a single season of planting and harvest, it is multiplied a hundred times over. One seed becomes a hundred. If you were to take those hundred seeds and put them into the ground and let them multiply a hundred times over, I can't even do the math on that. I'm a pastor, okay? It's like 10,000, I think. It's a huge number. You see how quickly just a couple of seasons of planting and harvesting doesn't lead to addition. It leads to multiplication. It leads to exponential growth. You've got to understand this. Everything you plant will end up growing and exceeding and multiplying over time. You will reap more than what you sow. Jesus told us the same thing. Mark chapter number four, he tells the parable of the sower and the seed. And he talks about seed that falls on bad soil and it gets eaten by birds. And then he eventually comes around in verse 20 and he's talking about seed that falls on good ground. And he promises that good seed on good ground will produce a harvest that is 30 times 60 times, even 100 times more than what was sown. You will reap more than what you sow. I think Paul even acknowledges this there in verse number eight. He says, if you sow out of the flesh, you will reap destruction. But if you sow out of the spirit, you will reap eternal life. Do you catch that? There is a multiplication effect. There is an eternal effect to some of the decisions that we make. That every time we sow, we will reap what we sow, and we will reap even more than we sow. Why is that? Why is it? How can we be sure that we will reap more than we sow? It's because of this. Time always multiplies decisions. Time always multiplies our decisions. For good and for bad, our choices become cumulative and compounded over time. Your choices, the things you do today, will accumulate and then be compounded, and then you will experience the harvest, the result of that. 
Now, when I say cumulative, what I mean is that most of the results that we experience in our life, they are, um, they, they are the, the sum total of innumerable small seeds that have been planted over the past weeks, days, months, years, whatever the case may be. Like the current state of communication in your marriage, for instance, is the sum total of all the conversations you guys have had together over the last few years. Every sarcastic comment, every I love you, every shut your face, everything you've said to each other. Uh, Come on, y'all are married, don't pretend. Um, Everything you've said to each other has brought you to the point that you are right now. All of those conversations have accumulated to create the reality that you live in. Your, your, Your financial life right now is the cumulative result of all of your spending and saving over the last few years. Even in small ways, All of those things have gathered together to create an impact that was greater than the individual seed that was sown. I can illustrate this uh, by this way. Um, Are you guys familiar with the 100-calorie snack pack? You know what I'm talking about when I say 100-calorie snack pack? It's like you go to the store and you get like a little package that's about this big, and uh, it is portioned out to be 100 calories of some little snack food. So you, you open it up, and you get four mini chocolate chips Ahoy cookies, right? Or you get seven Cheez-Its in your 100-calorie snack pack. And I'm like, what is the point here, all right? This seems like not a great thing. But the idea behind 100-calorie snack pack is that you are eating what is a relative insignificant amount of calories, right? Like if you struggle with portion control, if you're dieting, whatever the case may be, then uh, you can choose to eat this package instead of cracking open a whole box and you might end up better as a result, right? Or maybe you just want to treat yourself a little bit, all right? You can do that in a responsible way by eating the 100 calorie snack pack. The whole idea behind it is that it is pretty insignificant. But the truth is, a 100-calorie snack pack is not very insignificant if you let it accumulate over time. Do you know this? If you ate, if just every night, you're like, you know what? I miss having a little treat before I go to bed. So every night from now on, you crack open one of those 100-calorie uh, chocolate chip cookie packs, all right? If every night for the next year, you eat just one 100-calorie snack pack, you will be 10 pounds heavier at the end of the year. Oh, just over 100 calories. 100 calories is nothing. It makes no difference. What's the point, right? No, no, no. Why? Because it accumulates. One night is not going to be a big deal. If you want to treat yourself, go for it. If you want to treat yourself every once in a while, go for it. But when it starts to become a new habit, a new routine, a seed that you are planting day after day after day, eventually that seed is going to accumulate and it is going to produce a harvest bigger than you ever realized. You know, the opposite is true. Like if if you decided that you were going to cut just 100 calories from your diet every single day, and like if you've ever tried to lose weight, you know 100 calories is nothing. Like usually they're like, you need to cut like 400 calories in order to start really seeing results. But let's say you wanted to just cut 100 calories out of your diet every single day. By the end of the year, the reverse math works, you would be 10 pounds lighter than you are right now. That's a 20-point swing over a 100-calorie snack pack. Why? Because small decisions are not insignificant. Small decisions always accumulate. Things that seem like they don't matter in the moment will matter greatly when the harvest time comes. Our decisions are multiplied by time because they accumulate. They are also compounded over time. Time compounds every decision that we make. So suppose I offered you this morning $5 million. I'm not gonna. You guys would have been like, man, I'm glad I came to church today. No, I I can't do that, okay? Suppose, though, I made you an offer. I will give you $5 million in cash right now, or I'll give you a magic penny. The magic penny is this. Every day for the month of October, it's going to double in value. Which should you take? Five million to the penny. Quick, quick, right now. You got to tell me right now, right now. Okay, I heard a couple of fives and a couple of pennies. Now, I understand I've kind of set all this up so you know what the right answer is. If you were asking me just out of the blue, I'd be like, bro, give me five million and we'll call it even, all right? But the truth is, in this scenario, you should take the magic penny every single time. Why? You could do the math. I, had to, I went back and did the math three times because the first time I heard this, I was like, this cannot be true. It absolutely is. Take one penny and double it for 30 days straight. And at the end of the month, that one penny will be worth like 5.3 something million dollars. You will come out significantly ahead versus just taking 5 million cash. Oh, but you know what? Actually, I said we were going to do this for the month of October, and the month of October, as we know, has 31 days, which means if you took the magic penny from me today, your magic penny would be worth nearly $11 million by Halloween. 
That's the power of compounding decisions. That's the power of compounding over time. Every choice we make accumulates and then it multiplies. A penny is nothing. A penny is a joke. We don't even have pennies in Canada anymore. And yet, that one penny has the power to transform your life if you knew how to compound it right. Every decision you make is compounding. It is paying interest, either positive or negative, in your life. If you are wise, then you will utilize this principle. If you are foolish, then you will come up against untold hardship in life. You ever been to like a, a financial seminar or read a, a financial book, and they're like, if you want a million dollars by the time you retire and you're 18 years old, you just need to deposit like three cents a day in the bank. It's like something stupidly low, right? But if you're 43, 44 like I am and you want a million dollars by the time you retire, you got to put like $2,000 a day in the bank, all right? It's ridiculous. Why is there such... I hear that and I'm like, what was I doing? I wasted my 20s, you guys. This is so bad. Why, Why does it work that way? Because of the power of compounding over time. And the same is true. It's true in in planting and reaping. It is true in finances and investing. It's true in relationships. It's true in self-care. Time multiplies your decisions. You will have an accumulated and compounded harvest for good and for bad. You will always reap more than what you sow. Again, wise people understand this and they use it to their advantage Silly people, foolish people, deceived people, Paul would say, uh, choose to believe that things might work differently for them. Okay, there's one more aspect to the law of sowing and reaping, and honestly, it might be the hardest one of all. The, the first two, pretty obvious, but this is the one that just seems so, so hard to accept and, and to cooperate with. Okay, so you're going to reap what you sow, you're going to reap more than you sow, but the last one is that you reap only after you sow. Only after you sow. The harvest always comes in a different season than the planting. I know that's obvious, but it is really important to remind yourself of this. The harvest will come in a different season than the planting. For most crops, you plant in the spring and you harvest in the fall. If you plant in the spring and get mad that the harvest isn't here yet, that's kind of on you because that ain't the way the planting and the harvest cycle works. You harvest in a different season than you plant in. That means that you've got to work according to a seasonal mindset. You've got to have a patient mindset if you ever want the seeds that you're sowing to be a harvest that you eventually get to enjoy. You have to have patience during the process, just like a farmer does. Farmer plants his seed, he puts it in there, and then it's months before he ever gets to see the harvest. This is why I think so many people struggle to experience real breakthroughs in in areas of their life. It's not because they don't want to change. They absolutely do. It's not because they don't try to change. They certainly try. But often I think the reason we fail is because we forget that planting takes a season. It's not a one and done thing. You don't get to put one seed in the ground and expect that to turn into a full harvest. You don't get to do things once every so often, periodically. It is the the good planting that is done consistently throughout the season that will eventually become a harvest many times over for you to enjoy. So what that means is you're going to have to, if you're trying to get into a better shape financially, then you're going to have to change your spending, but not for a week or a month. You're going to have to change your spending for a whole season. And when it comes to like seed and fruit, A season can just be a few months, but in life, a season is often years. So the question is, if you want to get to a better place, are you willing to change your spending and saving habits for an entire season in order to experience the joy of the harvest? You'll have to. If you're going to, uh, if, you, if you are going to apologize to somebody, you're going to reconcile a relationship, you, you may not be able to just ap- apologize once and then it be done. Like, it, it, you can't simply say, like, I said, I'm sorry, what else do you want from me? Like, hey, listen, if you, if you ruin a relationship, it takes time to rebuild. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, like, 
let's say, let's talk about it in the context of a, ro a romantic relationship, let's say. Um, so, like, imagine that, you know, you spend years, you're dating, and everything's going great, and you're building trust, and then eventually building a family, and, you know, you get married, all that good stuff. And now, you have, like, this, the seeds that you planted have blossomed into kind of this beautiful, alive, vibrant sort of plant as a result, right? And then you do something really dumb, and you come and you cut that plant down. There is a tendency to think to yourself like, oh, well, we were just there and we can get right back there really quick. No, no, no. When, when you undo the harvest, you got to go all the way back to the planting season. And the planting season took years. And so like one dumb decision can undo years of hard work and good planting, and then you got to start over. And a lot of people don't want to do that. They're unwilling or unable, and so they never get back to the harvest season. So we've got to understand, sowing is a season. It is a long process, either the first time or when we're trying to, to undo things. So you've got to change with a seasonal mindset, long-term consistency in order to see any sort of results. You can't just pray once or twice and assume that Somehow you're going to be closer to God after that. It takes a long season of doing it consistently in order to feel like it has become a new routine. And hear me, there is going to be in the planting season very little evidence that your work is paying off. Very little evidence that progress is being made. Um, don't you love the uh, canola fields here in Alberta at the end of summer? Aren't they beautiful? Like, I love them. Almost every year, Amber and I will go out and we'll take pictures and we just like just enjoy the beauty of those. You know what I mean? People travel from all over the world to take their photos in front of those yellow canola fields. But here's the thing. That's harvest season. Do you know what nobody does on Instagram? Nobody goes out to the canola field in April or May when it's just an ugly dirt patch. Nobody goes out there and stands there and posts it on Instagram because it's not beautiful. It's not attractive. It's not desirable. It is ugly and desolate, and it doesn't look like anything good is happening there. But the farmer knows something that we cannot see. Seed has been planted. And underneath that ugly dirt patch, good things are going down. The seed is germinating. It's sprouting. It's growing up. It may not be visible yet, but one day it will poke through and it will produce a harvest many times more than the individual seed that was ever sown. You can't expect that you're going to reap in the season of planting. The season of planting is for planting. So this is where we get it wrong. We, we, we plant a few good seeds and we're like, why isn't the harvest here? And it's like, because you're still in the planting season. You're not yet in the harvest season. So you know what you have to do? You have to change your mindset in the planting season. In the planting season, you put those seeds in the ground and you think about what's coming, right? You think about the crop that will be here. The problem is it's so far in the future for most of us that like we can't then stay in the moment and do the hard work. We're just like, I want to get there. I'm doing this so I can get there. You have to change your mindset so that the planting season is full of victory and meaning in and of itself. So that you start to value planting the right seed instead of getting the desired harvest. You have to desire, you have to want, you have to value the hard work day to day of loving your spouse even when it's not easy instead of getting to the harvest of, oh, it's like a second honeymoon. That'll come. But if you try to get there too fast, then you're going to skip over the seeds that are going to get you to that point. You've got to value the discipline that says, no, I'm not going to go out tonight. I'm going to stay in and I'm going to eat because I know this is the wise financial choice. I'm going to plant that seed today. That's a win. Am I planting good seed today? Then I am winning. And I trust what the scripture says that I will one day reap a harvest, even a harvest full of righteousness if I don't give up. These are the laws of planting and sowing, that you reap what you sow. You reap more than you sow, and you reap only after you sow. Anyone who operates according to these will experience good things in life. It is not easy, but you will eventually have a harvest of good things and blessings. But if you choose to ignore them, then you continue to be foolish, you continue to be deceived, and your life is always going to be frustrating and unsatisfying because you can't ignore the laws that God has instituted into our existence. Now, 
I'm going to wrap up. But there, there's one more thing. Like, I need to tell you about the laws of, of sowing and reaping. Um, these are even more powerful than you realize. And we haven't even gotten to the good stuff yet, honestly, okay? This is, this is what takes kind of this message from like, yeah, that's good, and like a little self-helpy. Um, this is how you take it from there to like truly powerful and transformative, okay? These laws of, of sowing and reaping are so powerful that, when God himself decided he was going to do something about our salvation, when Jesus came to earth, he chose to operate underneath and according to the laws of sowing and reaping. God himself has chosen to operate according to the laws that he has established. You know, when, when God saw that we needed to be saved, he could have like just snapped his fingers and it'd be done. By divine fiat, he could have wiped away our sin debt and everything would have been A-OK without any effort on his part or our part. And yet, that is not how God chose to do things. Instead, Christ came into our world and he spent his entire life sowing. I know you've never thought about it like this, but this is exactly what happened. Christ spent his entire life sowing. He sowed seeds of obedience to God and God's law. He sowed seeds of wisdom. He sowed seeds of service to other people. He sowed sowed seeds of forgiveness, seeds of goodness every day for his entire life. Christ sowed and sowed and sowed and sowed and sowed. Christ was allowed to reap the harvest of the seeds he sowed. That his life of perfection, he sowed seeds of perfect obedience to God, and he reaped the harvest of resurrection in victory over sin, hell, and death on our behalf. Christ sowed and he reaped. He reaped what he sowed. He operated according to this first law of sowing and reaping. He certainly operated by the third law. The third law is that you reap more than you, or rather you reap after you sow. Um, This is true. Like for 33 years, I want you to understand this. For 33 years, Jesus sowed seed, but did not reap the harvest. Nobody appreciated him. The people he came to save, they despised and rejected him. He did not possess the glory and the power and the honor that was due to him as the second member of the Trinity, the Son of God Almighty himself. For 33 years he sowed, and it was only after that that he was able to reap the harvest. He was faithful, he was consistent, he did it in accordance with this law. You know, the scripture says, weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Christ endured a lot of weeping in his life, but he also got to experience the joy of victory, the joy of vindication, the joy of resurrection after he planted those seeds. And come on, he certainly, he certainly lived by that second principle as well. You reap more than what you sow. First Corinthians 15 The Apostle Paul says, Christ has been raised from the dead as the first fruits of all who die. That is, Christ sowing seeds that eventually led to his vindication in resurrection was not for himself only, but it has been multiplied billions of times over at this point so that you and I get to enjoy the harvest that he sowed. This is one of the few times we get to harvest something we never did So, We get the benefit. His sowing, his obedience, his sacrifice has been multiplied and given to us freely. Even God himself operated according to these principles of sowing and reaping. This is why I think the Apostle Paul says God cannot be mocked. Because you want shortcuts. I want to find a different way around these three laws. But if God himself didn't take a shortcut, why do we think we can? If we did that, we would mock the way God has instituted the world, and we would mock the lengths that he has gone to to show us the power of living in harmony with the three laws of 
of sowing and reaping. Hey, my prayer for you is that you would experience true lasting transformation in your life, that God would do something inside of you, that you would cooperate with it, and five years from now, you would experience an abundance, a harvest of righteousness, of good blessings that the Lord has in store for you, but are only possible if you sow the right seeds and you don't give up. God, I pray for those that are in the room today, and they need real change in their life. I pray first and foremost, God, that they would acknowledge that some of what they are experiencing is the result of the seed that they have sown. Maybe most of it, if not all of it. And so, God, I pray that they would no longer take the the attitude and position of a victim, but rather a victor in Christ. They would know that even if they've made mistakes, even if they've made uh, unwise choices to this point, through your word and through your spirit, they can overcome that, God, they do not have to live in shackles and slavery, but they can walk in freedom today and every day moving forward. God, would you grant that to them? God, would you help them to make wise choices that accumulate and compound over time, that produce generational harvests? that God move into eternity. I pray that they would experience this life overflowing that Jesus promised to each one of us. God, we're not gonna be able to do it on our own. We need your Holy Spirit working through us, helping us. And so God, we beg you for your help. We submit and surrender ourselves to you. And God, we will do our best to cooperate with whatever you call us to do. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen and amen.